Hello, I'm Ruth Schmidt from the Institute of Design in Chicago, uh, and today I'll be sharing some thoughts around the, the integration of strategic design research and behavioral design. And this term, Strange Bedfellows, comes from Shakespeare, actually, from uh, the play The Tempest. And what it describes is essentially how unlikely allies can uh, get together and create um, both an interesting combination, but also unexpected synergy that is not necessarily there or expected. Um, and I do believe that these two disciplines have the opportunity to do just that. Um, when we think about behavioral design, um, it comes from economics and psychology in combination. So as a response to economics, which assumes that everyone is uh, rational and does things in their best interest and has all the information they need. Um, but what I actually know is that that's not always true. And in fact, we're not always rational because we do things um, simply because of the way our brains are constructed. We don't always have the information we need, but on the other hand, we also have too much, especially these days. Um, and we don't always have our best interests at heart. Um, so even though we want to be healthy and exercise and do the right thing, there are often uh, things that get in the way of our own behavior. So this can contribute to just how we behave. Um, and it's a field that started in the mid 1970s and has increasingly been starting to coordinate with other disciplines, but mostly in the analytical spheres. So areas like sociology, critical geography, public policy, very much so. Um, but what I'm interested in exploring is how does that actually contribute um, how might strategic design play a role? Uh, because traditionally design has been seen as additive and useful, but there is yet to be a way to understand how to execute on that very well. So there is a lot of potential, but yet undiscovered. Um, and there are two specific ways in which strategic design, I think, can contribute in an incredibly valuable way to behavioral design. Um, and these two larger areas, which I'll speak to today, um, one is in the concept of problem framing. So how do we even decide and define what it is that we're solving for? Uh, and the other is the methodological approach, where behavioral design is analytical, strategic design is strategic, and it's generative, and it's synthetic. So in combination, these two areas actually do have a lot to offer one another. So first we'll talk a little bit about problem framing in particular. Um, and a very good illustration of that and kind of a classic behavioral design example is in organ donation. So typically speaking, one of the challenges of organ donation is that there aren't simply enough organs. Um, and behavioral scientists a number of years ago uh, realized that simply by designating uh, somebody as an opt-out rather than opt-in, uh, they would get more organs. And what that means is that if you have to choose to be an organ donor, even if you would like to, it's that tiny bit of extra effort that can keep you from doing so. In an opt-out situation, the default is that you will be donating your organs and therefore it increases the chances because now the extra effort is to opt out, as it says, um, and to sort of take yourself off of that list. So this has proven to be quite effective and quite useful. And in fact, in the original research that was presented, this was back in 2003, we can see the stark difference where um, at the time countries that were opt out have very, very high effective consent rates, nearly 100% in many cases. Um, and we see in contrast, opt-in, much less so. I'm from the United States, and at least at the time, our numbers were kind of hovering around in between the two in the mid-40s, partially because our states have different um, selections. So it's not an absolute, but it can give us a sense of what that looks like. Um, on the other hand, even though that looked initially successful, it actually had issues. So there's more recent research from a few years ago uh, out of the UK that indicates that opt out may get people on the donor rolls, but families don't um, always accept that idea. They don't regard it as full consent and it's often rejected. It's often dismissed and all of those donors now end up not donating organs. So this is an interesting case where if we think about it, the nudge or the behavioral intervention worked. We got more organ donors on the rolls, but the actual goal of increasing organs did not work because now people have rescinded that. Uh, they don't perceive the, the okay as valid. So what this really suggests to us, it's not that this was necessarily a bad solution, it was an incomplete one because what we're solving for is not actually organs, we're solving for transplants, right? We wanted to be able to be successful in that regard. And what this does suggest to us, and this is why strategic design research is so valuable for the behavioral design approach, is that if we looked only at behavioral design, increasing the number of donors still worked. That frame was still relevant, it actually had great success, but it's not sufficient by itself. 
And in fact, if we look at the other two areas that we really do need to be solving for, one is that families are equally a part of this situation. Um, we need to consider them as well. And that's really a strategic design element where we're thinking about user needs and user perceptions. How do we solve for the humans? Uh, but we also need to take into account the systemic requirements. So the fact that this is a much larger system, it's not simply about getting people on the rolls, it's also about making sure that there's a whole support system that allows for transplants to be executed well. So this case, even though it's often trotted out as a behavioral design element, it actually has quite a bit to say about why strategic design can be additive too. But the other element of framing that's equally important is that it's not simply about the nature of the problem that we solve for, it's also how we even think about what that problem is. So another interesting example from the United States is in the city of Flint, which is part of Michigan. Um, a number of years ago in 2014, there was um, a decision made for cost cutting purposes to transfer uh, the reservoir where water was coming from. And for this municipality, what it meant is that their water was now contaminated with lead. And that actually led to significant both health issues, but also obviously the downstream issues from lead contamination can lead to learning disabilities and learning issues down the road as well. Um, so this is a, a very strong behavioral, but also system and human problem once again. And in fact, the Obama administration, who was um, in power at the time, um, one of the things that their behavioral sciences team did was to look at Flint and to think about how does behavioral design uh, work? How, how can it help in this situation? So what's quite interesting here is that if we do think of it as a behavioral change problem, and behavioral design would go in thinking this way, it's really about adopting new behaviors. So this would mean things like hand washing where appropriate. It would also mean, um, you know, considering where bottled water might be necessary, boiling water where that makes sense. So it's about shifting and adopting new types of habits. And that all makes sense. Um, but it also starts to imply how we think about the nature of that problem itself. So it's a fairly neutral problem in this case, where it's about sort of solving for water and that the, the you know, dynamic between clean and dirty kind of makes sense to all of us. Uh, but what it also does is it starts to hide or put behind a curtain some other implications. So for example, Flint is not a very rich um, area. It actually has a lot of disadvantaged individuals and the extra costs of bottled water are not insignificant. So that was hidden. Um, it also sets up this narrative of personal responsibility, that if you fail to execute these things and if you fail to make behavioral changes, it's your fault. It's, it's something which is fully yours to be solving for. So that's a very distinct kind of story that we're hearing in this case. And the frame of that is around personal ownership, responsibility, but kind of it feels like it's got a, a straightforward solution. In contrast, if we look at a separate kind of narrative, it really is a deeper story of systemic inequity. And this is partly even sort of comes before the Flint issue uh, with water, simply because the nature of the economy and the way in which that uh, community had been treated largely um, had huge implications that it wasn't just about this one particular instance. There had been a long history of a feeling of disrespect and power dynamics that were incredibly important and had of great implications on how people perceived how the solution was being taken care of. Um, in addition, it also obviously sets up the sort of villain and victim um, sensibility too. the narrative itself is different. So this is an ind indication where framing makes a great deal of difference because it even sets up what we think the solutions might be. Um, if we transition now, so framing is one big area where strategic design can lend an enormous hand. We can also think about the nature of problem solving itself. And in this case, again, we can think of these as two slightly different perspectives that really have great implications on how solutions and problems are set up. Um, an analytic methodology is often about future, about, um, excuse me, uh, past data and how history and what we know can inform solutions, whereas synthetic methodology or generative methodology is often about what we don't yet know. And those are two very different approaches for problem solving. Um, and we can also look back and we can see um, how science and design, behavioral science and design, um, have actually had this interesting tension set up over many, many years. So as we look back through the history of how science and design have been set up, it's an interesting set in some cases of, we think of them together, in some cases they're diametrically opposed forces, 
in some cases, one might be set up as better than another um, or as leading to one another. So the nature and the tension between design and science, uh, or uh, in this case, um, behavioral science and design, um, has a long, long history that has, is yet a bit un unsettled. But if we think about it in this case, another way that we can approach it is by thinking in terms of inductive reasoning, which is more the scientific approach, which really is about what is likely to be a good solution, and abductive reasoning, which is more of a design-minded way, which is more about what is possible, what could be that we don't yet know. So if we think about these two forces, one instructive thing that I've been um, sort of seeing increasingly is that this isn't about one or the other or one better than. It's actually about using them collectively. And we can start to test this theory um, by using a very simple model um, that Vijay Kumar has, has used frequently uh, that helps us to think about, well, what are all of the processes of problem solving? And if we think about this as a bit of a canvas, we can start to understand how these different approaches uh, start to play out. So the tensions between concrete thinking and abstract work is one tension, and then the difference between conceptualizing things and then actually bringing them to life on the other hand. Um, so if we think about how this plays out in a few different settings, it can be very instructive to help us see how we might uh, both combine or integrate these two into a, a new discipline. So just for fun, because behavioral science and behavioral economics came out of economics, we can use that to start. And this really is starting from theory and yanking it right down into problem solving, um, which has its issues, of course. If we haven't been able to test things, it means that sometimes those don't match. When we think about behavioral science or behavioral design, it often starts in a principles level. So up in that top left, then gets sort of concretized with things that we know about the people in the context, and then solutions get made and tested. Um, so that's where we see this kind of pattern going from top left, bottom left, over to the right, whereas design is quite different. We often start with the knowledge of users, we then abstract principles up, and then we start to test solutions. So if we think about this inductive, abductive, behavioral science strategic design, they're really quite different in the nature of their problem solving. Um, that said, we, if we think about how they start to intersect and how they might inform one another, we get a very interesting picture. So in this case, we see here the behavioral design structure, where we start with principles of behavior and how people think and work. We make hypotheses out of them that are more concrete, and then we test them. We can consider how the design perspective may actually feed that. And in fact, I think it's in particular where hypothesis generation occurs, where design has the most to say. Uh, because the principles of behavior are still relevant, still extremely interesting. But what design can do is to learn about the people and the context and what we know, make a little bit more of an abstraction. So we start to pull in what we don't yet know or more speculative approaches. And it's these approaches that can help us to then define solutions that don't yet exist or where we don't simply have enough data. And that's actually often where behavioral science or behavioral design gets stuck, is that it's often rooted only in what we already are confident about. Design, as we know, is quite better, uh, much better for uh, what we might consider wicked problems. How do we actually think about things that don't yet exist, that don't have a simple solution? I um, mean, it can make us more strategic in our thinking. Uh, and then finally, when we think about what those interventions can tell us, they can then start to feed this cycle. So it's really in combination where we can start to learn quite a bit and not just solve individual problems, but start to create a much more strategic approach. Um, and then finally, the last point is that if we think about what works and what could be, um, it also means that we can start to think about the relationships between designers and users. Um, so in this case, if we think about these two models coming together, we can also see where um, what is currently a behavioral designer telling users what to do. Um, increasingly design, as we know, participatory design and co-design are ways to bring people in and in order to solve for problems that we know are going to be more important and relevant. Um, so I suspect that as we think about combining these, it's going to lead from uh, thinking about not just the process, but also how we involve individuals. So the sense of how we bring users in, um, not just as end recipients, but also as co-creators in the solutions. Thank you.